Katrina, Zahini, Sahil, and JJ. I think we'll we'll go through a round of intro. Um, before that, just wanted uh, a quick reminder that this is part of Hack to the Future, our um, global fintech hackathon. And to learn more, you can uh, check fintech.devpost.com. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, um, Katrina. Great. Thank you, Shireen. Um, we're going to be spending most of the day in Mural, so I'm going to put a link in the chat, and if everyone could just click on that, enter their name, um, and sign in, and then we will get started. Um, and if anyone's having any trouble, please let us know. Great, I'm seeing some icons and animals pop in. I know it's working. <laughs> but again, if anyone's having any trouble, let us know. Also, it's better to use it in Google Chrome if you are entering that way. Um, so that's a little tip. All right, I see eight people in there and we definitely have more than eight people on this call. So again, I'm going to invite you all to please, please click on the link and enter your name and we're going to be working in there. Okay, great. I'm seeing more people join. I'm going to give everyone a, one more minute to get in there and then we'll get started. Um, Katrina, do you mind also please uh, sharing your screen so it's available as part of the recording? Um, Sahini, you know, we, we did want to try and um, get people to get in the mural versus just watching our screens, um, at least for this session live. So we can, but um, we just want to make sure that everyone is still going to be in mural participating rather than just watching our screens. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So everyone joining us today, please uh, join the mural link. This would be just for, for the everyone else that would be watching the recording later. Yeah. Can, okay, we, uh, uh, can you confirm if you see me online? I'm not sure if I got in. Let's see, I ha see 14 people in here now. Um, let me check. Yes, I see you. Okay, perfect, thanks. Awesome. OK, great. Well, let's get started then. Um, I'm going to summon everyone to our first board. Um, so thank you again for joining. Um, and if you have not used Mural, we just want to give you a little bit of an introduction. So think of Mural and this whole board as a big virtual whiteboard where we're going to be spending our day here. Just like if we were in person live, we would be you know, adding sticky notes to a whiteboard or writing things down. Um, so that's what really Mural allows us to do digitally online. Um, and so I just want to show everyone quickly how to use Mural. Really, the biggest things we're going to do is just navigate around the board, which I'll help us all with by summoning you like how I did today and just how I did right now where I have 13 people following me. Um, but also to move around the board, you're going to hold down your space bar and there, you're going to see a little hand pop up and then you'll be able to just dra um, you know, move around easily without adding sticky notes or anything. Um, and then the next thing we're going to do and what I want to make sure everyone knows how to do is how to add sticky notes because this is how you're going to add your input. So all you need to do is double click and start typing. And that's how you add a sticky note. So if everyone could practice that here. Just double click. And start typing. And you can, when you double click, you'll see that you can change the color, the size of your font, um, things like that. Yep. 
perfect. Seeing lots of great sticky notes. Hello, Finastra. <laughs> great. Well, does any, um, oh, I'm a sticky, perfect. All right, I think we all have mastered the sticky notes. Um, so I am going to, in the interest of time, um, just introduce what we are going to do today within the next couple hours, um, and then I will pass it over to Scotiabank. So what we are going to be doing today is really taking some time to kind of frame the, pr frame the problem here. Um, so hearing from Scotiabank first about lending at POS and how, you know, what we're doing, what this new pathway is for retailers, what lending is, um, and then Oops, and then um, from there, we're going to dive in deep into our persona, take on um, Christoph, and really identify what his the, the demand is, the supply is, the enabler is. So really just identifying this whole problem space. Um, and then we're going to deep dive and be able to ideate so you can take these ideas and solutions to your hackathon project. Um, so before I pass it over to Scotiabank, uh, Sahini, any other any comments before we give them the stage for the next couple minutes? Um, well, I, I guess I'm curious to hear from um, Sahil exactly, you know, what the genesis was of this particular problem space uh, that we are solving for, and um, we we want to understand from your perspective um, specifically what you would like to add in terms of the space um, as value from, from your bank's perspective? Because we have certain terminology uh, in terms of how we call, you know, you as a player within the banking as a service space. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to see, you know, what your thinking is from that perspective, and then we can start probing further as, as we hear more from you. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Um... So let me know when I can get started, or is, do we do we have any other uh, introductory comments before I start off? No, I just, okay, yeah. perfect. <laughs> All right, uh, thanks thanks for the stage. Um, so my name is Sahil. I'm the uh, product lead on the authentication team. Our team basically takes care of uh, authentication for Scotiabank across the mobile app and uh, web for our retail customers, our wealth customers, and our small and medium business customers. So our team basically is uh, the front door for the authenticated uh, space that the customer can get into. So that's uh, a little bit about me. Um, so we were very interested in this space. Uh, this is a great uh, space to be in uh, lending at uh, point of sale. Um, in the past few years, we've seen uh, the, the rise of the buy now, pay later uh, way of doing uh, uh, purchases and a lot of companies like uh, Affirm or, or um, Afterpay and Klarna have come into the space. They're basically um, offering customers a better user experience and uh, more options in terms of credit when they're buying uh, 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 items at, at retail stores. Uh, it used to be for big ticket items, but now it's being used for everything from, uh, you know, uh, buying at your um, fashion stores or um, at your grocery stores or any kind of purchases. Um, the theme as, uh, as, as we're looking at, which is um, how can everybody be a fintech uh, and how can uh, there be an opportunity uh, for somebody to get into this and add this as a business model for, for their business. Um, what we were thinking of was with the onset of open banking and there's so much information available, so much financial information available. What is the opportunity over here for um, retail uh, companies to find an opportunity in this journey of the purchase? And how can retail companies find an opportunity to offer um, something like a buy now, pay later, uh, which third parties are offering? But is there a possibility for retail retailers uh, to get into the space? Um, and it would be a great, uh, great space for them to get into um, because there's an opportunity for them 
to add something new to their business model, uh, not just selling products, but maybe even financing it. Um, and then there's an opportunity for them to uh, collaborate with the banks on being able to offer these uh, new services. So that's how we were thinking about it. Uh, it's a new opportunity. Uh, the buy now, pay later uh, market itself is growing uh, at tremendous speeds. Uh, it's supposed to be growing at 22% CAGR from now to until uh, the next five years. And the market is going to become a trillion dollar market uh, by 2025. So huge opportunity, a great space for new entrants. And we want to know if uh, the hackers here today can figure out if there's a opportunity for retailers to get into the space. Thanks, Zaha. So just to add to that, so I was talking briefly about terminology that we use here at Finastra to describe the various players and what their role is in the banking as a service sort of value chain. So in your description, just you know, FYI for everyone else that doesn't um, understand this space as well as the terminology that we use. In this case, the retailer would be called an embedder, okay, because they are the point, the touch point that a consumer is interacting with to make that purchase. So in this, let's give an example here. We talked about Best Buy being that retailer. So in our story, um, Best Buy would be the embedder as well as the distributor of the particular good, in this case, not the service. Um, and the question that Sahil is asking is, can this distributor and embedder have an embedded financial product within their service uh, offering, as opposed to relying at, on a separate financial entity, uh, separately like a credit card, which is typically how we normally purchase goods today. Um, in the absence of the Klarna's, et cetera, already having integrated into their layer. Is that a fair statement to make, Sahil? Absolutely, yeah. Giving them uh, the opportunity to also play in the space. Um, and they have a great relationship with their customers. So how would they be able to leverage on that as well? Okay. Any other comments or questions from anyone else? All right, Sorry, so just speaking, I wanted to add um, what BNPL stands for because we keep using it everywhere. And I know I'm going to show my face. And I know that um, maybe for some people it doesn't make any sense what, what is BNPL. So it's buy now, pay later, which usually like uh, when you go on a website and you're like, oh, that costs $400. I don't know if I should pay that. And they're like, wait, 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 wait. Pay $100 per month for four months and we'll give it to you now. Uh, it's really what BNPL stands for. OK, so, so to, to make this even tighter in scope, the problem that we are solving for a question for Sahil. Um, in, in this story, do we care about where in the journey this purchase is being made from? Is it e-commerce led or is it brick and mortar or both? Well, the opportunity is everywhere. Um, if it helps to tighten the scope, we could start with e-commerce. Um, it might be a simpler. Uh, user journey. Uh, the touch points at a brick and mortar might be a lot more. Um, I'm, I'm open to either. We could do e-commerce only, brick and mortar only, or both, whatever works in terms of uh, the scope for everyone. All right, let's go for omni-channel because that would be ideal, right? So just Perfect. restricting ourselves is not really, it's not sensible because what happens then if you go to a store and you know, you're scratching your heads about Absolutely. With this consumer? So if that's the case, um, there were certain elements to the problem statement that you presented to us, which include two things. One was uh, specifically about this individual, the persona that we're talking to being new to credit, right? There was that, that was an interesting angle to be approaching this problem from. And the second thing that we noticed was interesting was you you did talk about in the two persona examples that you gave us, um, the fact that there was an inherent sense of loyalty to the, the, the retailers that they were making purchases at. So is that really important to the way that we are framing the problem? Well, I would say yes, the, the first part where, um, you know, a new customer is coming in, 
Uh, there are a lot of dependencies on somebody being able to use credit today. Uh, you need to have a credit score. You need to have a, a credit bureau file. Uh, you need to be uh, eligible for a certain amount of credit. Um, and there are a lot of uh, use cases where certain um, populations of customers may not be able to leverage that. Um, but for example, if I'm going to a restaurant or a retailer very often, and the retailer knows that I always pay on time, I'm a great customer for them, why not use that as an opportunity? Uh, the customer may not be eligible for external uh, financial uh, products, but this retailer could make a choice to service this kind of a customer. So that's a great opportunity for them. Um, and in terms of loyalty, absolutely. Um, this becomes an additional service that the retailer is offering, which will create more stickiness for the customer to keep shopping at that retailer. So it works both ways. Excellent point. Um, the only thing that I, I, I guess I'm speaking for Katrina as well, when we were discussing this, um, we were wondering what the likelihood is of someone who's a regular customer of a typical high ticket item like a sofa or a fancy TV to not have access to credit. It sounds a bit counterintuitive, right? Especially so, if you're saying that they're loyal and they're repeat purchases at that particular retailer. So the the uh, the opportunity here is not only for big ticket items, as I as I mentioned earlier. It used to be for big ticket items, but now it could be at your grocery store. It could be at, at regular restaurants okay. or even at your uh, uh, you know uh, pizza hut. Uh, if you are a regular customer, how can this retailer or how can this uh, merchant reward you? Uh, there might be other aspects that they could offer. Um, yeah. and, 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 you know, it doesn't have to be somebody who's buying a $4,000, um, you know, sofa, um, a one time purchase in a few, few years, but it could be regular purchases. Right. There is a question. Yep. Please. Perfect. It's, uh, it's not a question. It's more like a comment. Um, and it, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I see this as uh, not uh, not necessarily for tickets where the person has not access or not is not able to do the landing or have a loan, or more like an I items that otherwise would be spent with a credit card. And this would be much better and much more convenient and cheaper. Otherwise, the person the person wouldn't go to a bank and ask for a loan to buy a TV. He would just put on a credit card and pay along like the whole year with high interest rates. The buy now, pay later, or the POS financing, as you want to call it, would be a much better uh, alternative. And if there was not that alternative, that person might say, you know what, I'm going to buy this TV two years from now. So it's good for everybody. He can buy the TV or she can buy the TV. The store can sell more. And six months from now, he may come back and buy something different, not a TV. And that same store, because you already know the convenience and the product choice. That's the way I see it. Yeah, I, I think you had a very important word here, Marcelo, that was convenience, right? Um, the, it's convenient to access to credit. I think everyone can go to a bank and ask for a loan and do all the paperwork and blah, blah, blah. But the, the reason why people use credit card and are willing to pay like 15% APY is because it's so convenient. You just use it, you're like, oh, I just need to pay later. You don't even realize how much you're going to be charged in the end, right? So this is almost like a, a fraudulent scheme, credit card, when you think about it, because they're like, well, don't think about it. Just don't, we'll charge you later. Whereas with a BNPL, you can make it convenient and more affordable in a way. So it's almost like a good deed. Did Shireen have a point as well? I saw your hand raised for a second there, Shireen. No, sorry, that was just an error. <laughs> okay. Right. Yes, please. Uh, yes, just a quick comment to add some data to it. Um, a, firm, a firm says that after enrolling uh, customers to their network, uh, and met merchants to their network, and vendors to their network, uh, the, the uh, repeat uh, uh, purchase from, from customers, customers repeat purchases increased by 20%. Yep, I can see why that be. Now, going back to that omnichannel question, right? So me as a consumer, when I go through my purchase decisions, 
I have access to credit. I have multiple credit cards. However, if I have the option, especially on e-commerce portals, to use um, alternative credit forms from Klarna or PayPal, for example, I would opt for them. And I am not sure why I make that choice. I just automatically make that choice somehow, even though I'm, I'm not in the habit of particularly, you know, rolling my credit line, right? I pay off monthly, so there's no credit uh, as, a, as a consequence of that choice. But I still prefer to do this with Klarna or PayPal based on, you know, what I have uh, as an option in the UK. Uh, I'm curious to, you know, open up this as a quick survey amongst our audience. How do you see yourself behave um, you know, given this, uh, you know, so set of options when you're purchasing online. And second question, as a sort of addendum to the first, what do you normally do when it's an offline purchase and you don't have the same set of options? Because personally, me, I've never seen Klarna being an option when I'm making a purchase in store, right? Because it hasn't extended itself that well to the brick and mortar sort of business models, uh, at least in my experience. So first question is, which do you choose? Do you go for the credit card or do you go for BNPL option today? And second, how do you handle this in an offline environment? I can go ahead quickly. <laughs> Based out of UK, I usually stay away. I mean, from BNPL, but having said that, the moment PayPal comes into picture, it kind of, I feel slightly more secure. Mm. Uh, that is my reason why I would go for PayPal. Uh, I've not used Klarna, but for a lot of uh, cosmetic sites and all, uh, they immediately give you discounts. Uh, so which kind of uh, helps you, attracts you uh, sometimes and then buy uh, now and pay later. But personally, never use Klarna. But yes, for PayPal, the movement, especially on eBay, yeah, you see some any product, I am immediately wary of using my credit card. I don't know why, although I know I'm more secure through my credit card as well, especially coming to UK, I'm realizing that. But PayPal right. is for me, go to security option. That's why. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That's a very interesting observation there. I, I, I tend to do the same as well because I think PayPal has reliably often intervened whenever there's been disputes in my experience. So I, I would agree on that note completely. What about others? How do you react? And it doesn't have to be a UK only sort of uh, experience. Anyone based in the US, perhaps. What is your experience of this? Katrina, what about you? What do you do? <laughs> I, I am always using my credit card. I'm the type of person where if I have the points that I'm trying to get to or the cash back, I want to use that versus using a buy now pay later solution um so it's interesting to hear how you guys are using that but i think i i play more of the credit card game in the points and the cash back nice interesting point yes i see you raised hand yeah. Yeah, go ahead all right so yeah just wanted to say that i'm based out of eastern europe um bulgaria and uh, yeah so here we are starting to see the buy now pay later trend i'm actually just shopping for a laptop at this very moment <laughs> and i'm looking that basically a provider online is uh, yeah giving me the opportunity to buy an apple you know newest macbook <laughs> uh, with a zero percent interest rate and that, that's definitely something that i'm yeah interested in because obviously yeah uh, paying uh yeah two thousand euro uh, out of my pocket versus paying them over 18 months is uh you know even the, the price of money says yeah. uh, that you know <laughs> something that i will pay over time is much better uh, then just paying it out, even because when I use my credit card, I'm usually using it only uh, to buy for the current month. And then when I get my salary, I pay off my complete debt. So I yeah. won't be uh, paying some uh, interest uh, uh, like revolving credit cards, you know, revolving, just paying the minimum revolving, revolving amount. So, yeah, I mean, this is this is what I can say. Uh, of course, there's, you know, they probably are kind of trying me out, you know, I'll pay zero now, but someone will pay the interest, right? I and mean, probably the merchant will pay it or something like that for promotion reasons, but they'll sell more. So maybe uh, what's your perspective actually as experts in the field? Like what is, 
the thing that uh, how is business working? Because it doesn't make any sense, right? Someone, uh, somebody's <laughs> paying here uh, the, the lunch. That's a great question. Any of our SMEs on the call want to answer that? Yeah, please, Pierre Sahil. Sorry, was the, was the question on how this this makes sense for? Yeah, for, yeah kind of. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, well, basically, the way it makes sense is um, the the uh, the uh, lending company like Klarna or Afterpay or Affirm basically gets a cut from the merchant. Um, and as you can see, the, re the, the result of that is 20% more repeat purchases. So that's where the merchant gets the benefit. But if it was, say, a product that was um, $100, um, a firm would get it for, say, 90 and then be charging you $25 in four months. So that's where it makes its money. And the merchant basically gets, and I'm just simplifying it, re really simplifying it, but that's where the uh, the the metrics come in in terms of who's making what. Uh, it's convenience for the customer. It's repeat customers for the merchant. It's a sale at that moment. You might not have bought the $2,000 laptop, but at least here, the merchant's able to make a sale at $1,900, uh, where the 100 would go to a firm. And I'm just making up numbers, but you see how it creates habits in customers, and that's the long game. What? All right. It's also like uh, <clears throat> you're like just providing a discount. It's like you, your MacBook is two thousand dollar. I don't know when it's Black Friday, you can get it at like one thousand nine hundred or something like that. And the merchant is willing to sell to that price because they lower the margin, but it's they still make a margin, right? So what they what they would say is, I'm gonna sell it to you to 1900 uh, $1, The only difference you get is you don't buy it for nine thousand nine hundred. You buy it for two thousand over eighteen months. And Klarna or our firm, or whoever is a BNPL, takes that cut. But the merchant is happier because he's making more sales as well. And I think the repeatability as customer is key, is that you're like, I had a great experience. I'm very likely to use this again and go to this shop again. So it's also about make, making the experience so great that you want to come again. Um, and just to answer the other, experience, the other question that uh, Saini was mentioning, um, uh, as a as a Frenchman, we don't really pay with money we don't have, right? So I'm, I live in the U.S. now, and I realize that everybody is using money they don't have. It's crazy. It's like if they go anywhere, they're like, oh, look, I want this. I'm just going to buy all of that. You're like, but you don't have the money. They don't care. They just do it, right? And they're like, I just, I can do credit and everything. So for me, it was completely wild, just the concept of spending money you don't have. Uh, and we don't really have credit card in France. I think it came very later on when I moved to the US, we stopped having credit card. So I didn't have the habit of putting on credit card. I feel like a BNPL might be more accessible for my brain of <laughs> like spending money I don't have because I'm actually not spending. I'm spending only when I have the money. So in a way, it would wire better in my brain than using money I don't have now. That's super interesting. I'd like to counter one thing to to what uh, Pierre said. Um, the The whole concept of credit is from a very macro level. It's an extremely important economic uh, tool used by uh, by by countries, um, which allow credit uh, uh, products to be available. Uh, when you look at the growth of uh, the West compared to the other countries, where credit may not be as easily accessible. The countries that have easy credit available have a much larger growth. Uh, people are more, uh, uh, they have more opportunities to, you know, rotate their money and, and buy products. And um, basically there's a rotation as well as there's growth that ha that's happening. So these products basically from a micro level, yes, customer merchants benefit, but from a macro level, you're giving more people more opportunity, uh, the access to things at a point in time that they might not be able to have access, but that enables them to do a lot more. So when you look at it from you know a World Bank report point of view, they'll see they, you'll see in those reports that the countries that have more access to credit, the economy is a much more stronger one. So that's the macro uh, aspect of things. 
I, I'd like to add another comment and a regional perspective to it. Um, I'm from Latin America, I'm from Colombia, and in Colombia, um, the, the, the situation first demographically, uh, close to 50% of the country is under 30 year, years old. So a lot of people don't have a credit card. 85% uh, per half of the people doesn't have a, a, a credit card. And there, there have been some, comp some companies offering a, a, a very primitive approach of buy now, pay later, which is not uh, scalable. It's just single company working with a specific financial institution trying to figure out how to provide a service like this. Um, and they have got a lot of engagement. Even some of the more successful ones have created their own branded credit card. Because given that the buy now pay later model is not easily scalable, the way as 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 a, a young customer is that uh, uh, if you are a young customer and you got in touch with credit through this, uh, uh, then you want to also use credit elsewhere. And given that buy now, buy now pay later is not is not available elsewhere, your next best approach is to use a credit card. And probably the credit card is going to be branded, for example, by a utility company that created this buy now, uh, pay later, a uh, closed ecosystem. Uh, now brand branding a credit card so that you as a, as a young customer can, can use that to get credit to buy something else in, in other uh, 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 commerce retailer. Great, thank you. All right, so I think we've talked quite a lot about, you know, trends that we're seeing in different markets and how people's approach as in terms of attitude towards borrowing overall. And there, interestingly, I think BNPL 1.0 was exactly that, where you had access to a credit card who would facilitate an EMI format, potentially for some number of months at 0% interest and you know, would start generating interest after a few months or for the entire period, depending on what the scheme was. And that's how, you know, deferred payment originally started until the fintech started disrupting that space and what we see today is BNPL 2.0. So coming back to the original sort of problem that we are trying to solve for, one thing that stood out in that problem statement is the fact that this persona that we're speaking to has no credit history. They're new to credit. And so therein lies a trick there and you know something that we have to think a little bit harder about. So I think it's time that we jump straight into the persona and some of the sort of insights that we can generate from the audience. So I'll hand over to Katrina and she'll run us through the, the next exercise that we'd like to do now. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Sahini. Um, so with that exactly, we want to kind of take on um, this persona and, and develop some some insights about this, right? We just had this great discussion of buy now, pay later versus a credit card, what you do. Um, so now let's think about what Christoph does here. Um, so Christoph just moved to London and he wants to furnish his new apartment um, and he wants to finance a new TV. But since he moved from a dif different country, he doesn't have that financial history and he doesn't have access to credit. So how can Christoph go about financing his TV? Right. This is the where we're at right now. This this problem space. So I want to have us take um, a couple minutes here to really think about um, Christoph. And let's think about what are his concerns and considerations when he's going about financing his TV. Um, and I want to do maybe a silent um, brain dump here. So I'm going to set the timer for two minutes at first and we'll see how that goes. Um, but put down sticky notes, thinking about if you were Kristoff, what would your concerns be in considerations when you wanted to go about financing that TV? So I'm going to set the timer and remember just double click and to start typing.
give everyone a couple more seconds to wrap up their thoughts. And as we have some people writing our last thoughts down, why don't we start to just read what others have put down? Um, and then we'll invite everyone to ask questions or comment on what they're seeing. Any questions that people have about what they're reading right now? Any comments, questions? I have a question on a couple of points here. So there's one which is how simple is the process and the other is dispute management. So what process are we talking about here? And when it comes to dispute management, what kind of dispute are we envisioning here? See David has a question. Yeah, this is David. I'm in America. I work in support, and it's kind of um, naive to believe that software is going to work 100% of the time, all the time. You know, so problem is when I think about you know an embedded process, I'm thinking about you know problems and uh, the customer experience that could greatly affect how you know our consumer comes back to you know order again. So you have to have some way of figuring out um, how to resolve, you know, different problems and ordering. So it's more focused on the customer when things go wrong, kind of a question. Yeah. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. Usually uh, in a BNPL, one of the main uh, uh, pain points is that uh, you order something and uh, with BNPL, and the object that you have ordered is broken for X, Y, Z reason. How, and how you can return it, but the loan is already engaged. Can I cancel my, uh, can I cancel my order? And so on. So this is one use case of dispute. Another use case of dispute is um, in, uh, in UK, you can order online, but you can cancel the order after uh even after so is the loan already issued how how this is uh so this is one use case of dispute management Got that it. is not so easy understand thank you so much for clarifying that well, uh, francois that was my sticky note dispute, dispute management but you handled it very well <laughs> <clears throat> what I had in mind for dispute as well is um, uh, if uh, you ask for a good and the good is not you know, received, I know that when I order on Amazon, they're like, sure, we'll reimburse you. We don't need to know anything. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, I had like SodaStream where I had like two canister and they say, oh, we never received them. And then I, there is nothing I can do. Like they have to charge me, but I did send it back and I don't know how to manage that. So that's something that might need to be managed as well on top of the regular dispute management rail, which is on top of this, there is a loan. How do you manage that, right? Maybe it's a higher amount and then I need to pay a loan installment. I have no idea how I'm going to be able to pay that. All right. So you're imagining, Pierre, that you've already made a purchase and then you're concerned about the post purchase experience rather than how to fund the purchase of the TV at this retailer. Exactly. And how it can impact the loan and how it will impact the loan itself. And where have you got this loan from in the story? 
That's the thing from a BNPR. So my guess is a loan come from a third party, right? So I have an agreement with the merchant, which is give me the good, I'll give you the money. And I think the good is not great, so I'm supposed to have the money back, but there is a lack in the money because okay. the merchant received 1,900, not 2,000, for example. So how are you going to manage the gap? I think Sahil has an idea. Yeah. Yeah. I, thanks. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, bring in one point here, which is in this whole ecosystem, um, keep let's let's keep the BNPL uh, players outside and focus on if this was the retailer, the merchant that was part of this equation, how much easier it makes it for the customer. Right now, you're dealing directly with the merchant who has offered you that um, credit service. Does that solve the problem in all of these dispute management, warranties, return policies, something's broken? Because now you're dealing directly with the merchant who's offered you the service, right? So how does that help? So let's maybe focus on, on that aspect. Uh, the BNPL was an example of the market, but right. this is the, the, the merchant that is stepping into this game. Which is a fantastic segue to the next question that we're going to do the exercise on, which is what does the supplier provide, in this case the merchant, in context of financing the product on sale? Right. So the question is, we put ourselves in the shoes of the customer who is, what's his name? Christoph, is it? Um, and what is the merchant that he's going to doing to solve the problem of financing that TV for him, supporting him in that? So we put ourselves in the shoes of Christoph and start responding to that. What are your expectations um, from the merchant? So two minutes for that again. Perfect. Again, just to clarify, I think some people are putting themselves in the shoes of the merchant. That's not the ask. The ask is you put yourself in the shoes of Christoph, the person who's going to buy the TV. And the question is, what does the supplier provide to Christoph? So what are Christoph's expectations from the merchant from a financing perspective? Right, and just clarifying a little bit more too, right? This is something that maybe the buy now, pay later solutions don't have and can't support him that way. So what what are they, what can the retailer provide that's even better? And since that was a you know a little bit of a trickier question, I'm going to add um, one minute to the clock here.
All right, and that is time. Um, we'll give everyone again a couple seconds to write down their last thoughts or finish what they're typing. Um, and as we do that, um, please start to look at what others have put down and then we will discuss. As we review these, does anyone have any questions or comments? Some really good points here. Very interesting. Yeah. Whoever said rent to own program, brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Well, if nobody has any questions, I'd like to ask the question of um, someone who wrote down retailer may provide layaway can pay over time with not increased cost but required delay gratification. Um, does anyone want to speak about that or talk about that a little bit more? Hi, this is Jen. I'm in Lake Mary at Finastra. Um, in America, uh, there used to be pretty popular. I'm probably one of the few persons on the call old enough to remember this, but there used to be pretty popular programs and whole uh, merchant storefronts based around you could outfit your entire apartment and just slowly pay a little bit on each item in your apartment. So it's an interesting contrast here. I, I find it very similar. It's more of like a, a techie way to do the same thing. But if the merchant wanted to retain all the funds themselves, they could come up with some kind of program like that and not not use buy now, pay later. Definitely, that's a great point. There seems to be a repeating pattern that I notice in terms of um, some level of cynicism in dissatisfaction in the product and what happens after. So it, it's leading towards that dispute resolution space. Uh, and the concerns when it comes to that is less about the financing aspects, it's more about the typical sort of cycle of buying a product not being particularly happy and then what happens next you know those sort of anxiety but most of the others are speaking about how can the financing aspects be resolved given that Christoph has no credit history and potentially needs some help in you know cash flow management um yeah i think we're also seeing um a similar theme as well around just rewards. Um, I was seeing a couple sticky notes down about what what the supplier can provide, maybe it's rewards or additional benefits that by now pay later can't provide. Um, if anyone wrote down that, do they want to maybe talk about what those rewards could be another layer deeper into that? I can go. Um, so the the uh, the benefit that the merchant has is um, they have a lot of data about the customer, the purchase, and if it's a repeat customer, um, they'd be able to and and they'd have the power to, you know, offer um, maybe a discount or um, a freebie or a additional warranty or an insurance. There are a lot of mm -hmm. capabilities that the that the merchant has over here because they have data of the end to end purchase. So it could be rewards or it could be additional uh, benefits like, uh, you know, even in terms of dispute management, uh, it could be a warranty extension. It could be um, an insurance capability. Um, you know, those would alleviate the, the fear uh, from a customer's point of view. Now, going deeply technical into the space, so typically a loyalty program goes by specific RFM metrics, right? So we know how RFM is described as recency, frequency, and monetary value of you know the purchase behaviors of specific uh, customers in a CRM database. Now, 
given that the story here is Christoph, who's new to the market and doesn't have credit history, it's unlikely that the merchant already has a lot of history. But let's extend this for the sake of the story that, you, you know, uh, Christoph was a loyal customer somewhere else in another market. And they've been able to bring that story over and say, you know, you've been a great customer. You've been, you know, proven loyal customer in another market. So we would like to extend you the courtesy of, you know, establishing a great relationship in this market as well. And therefore, we'd like to offer you X, Y and Z, right? Something like that, which brings us to the next question. There is, of course, a, a financial institution that's supporting the merchant in enabling this embedded financial product, right? So how do we address the risk factor, you know, whether or not Christoph is going to be able to pay back if we do extend him a line of credit or whatever it is that we give him? How do we assess risk for someone who you don't have a, an established credit history with in that market? Because that's really what the enabler, the financial enabler, of this product at that merchant is going to wonder. Is that a fair question to ask, Sahil? Is that the right question? Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to add one uh, quick quick note on the, the previous point that you made. Uh, the person may not have a credit history in the new country, yeah. but if you consider their, their behavior uh, in their past, um, you could get a lot of data. So just, just as an example, a very simple example, uh, say McDonald's. McDonald's is across the globe. I may have been a great customer for McDonald's in my previous uh, uh, country. If they're able to use that on a global level, um, this is this is basically taking as an example. If you if you have an American Express card in a different country, they're able to use that same data to offer you credit in a new country where you had no credit history because they're able to look at your past performance and your past financial behavior uh, because it's one company, American Express, yeah. uh, and that gives them the advantage, right? So it could be similarly done with merchants. Uh, merchants have a global footprint. They could use data from other customers. Uh, they could match it uh, and, and you know, uh, give you uh, a better uh, service. Um, basically, it'll, it, that's that's leading to this third question that you asked. Uh, how do you access? How do you assess the uh, credit worthiness? And there are a lot of data points that they could be using. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the perfect, perfect segue, Sahil. So I'm going to set the timer for two minutes, um, and let's start to think about this. Right? How how do you, how would you assess that credit worthiness? So again, also we're kind of uh, taking our hats off, our Christopher hats off, and putting on our financing institution hat. <laughs> oh, Sahini, did you have a point? No, it was an error. <laughs> no. Okay. no problem.
All right, that is time. Um, let's give everyone a couple seconds to finish their thoughts. And as we do that, review what others have put down. Some great thoughts and comments that people put down. Does anyone have any questions on what they're reading? Just wonder which data as does um, do we have access to? You know, like it's there is so many ideas we can get. I just wonder what what visibility do we have? What if it's a newcomer? I mean, if it's an Amazon style big shop, yeah, of course you have tons of data, but if it's a newcomer, if it's a, a small shop at the corner of the street, I wonder. That's a great question. Does anyone, what, is it, what does everyone think about that? What is, what would that data be? It's, um, it's the data from your bank. Meaning that uh, it does not means to, it does not need to, to be the data of the, of the shop. It can be that uh, you allow data sharing, and so uh, with that, I'm a new customer of uh, Amazon. They want to know more about me. Can give me, I can give them access to my data or to uh, a third party provider that will do uh, my scoring because it will um, be capable to uh, assess my uh, revenue and assess my spending. So give me a credit score. So it can be bank or it can be internal of the shop. And I think right now the, the, the way the world currently exists is that it's mostly banks that provide the data, or at least credit scoring that provide the data. Uh, whereas if you look at Klarna, I think they don't use any data, right? Usually it's credit bureaus that give it that to you. So you do a request to one of the three big credit bureaus, and they give you a credit score. Um, I, Klarna, they take the risk, right? Because they say, hey, this stuff costs $400. You're going to pay $100 per uh, month for four months. But they take the risk. So I wonder how they assess this risk, because they, they're not part of the bank. They don't know anything. They don't do it all the time, uh, Pierre, because if it's a high ticket item above a certain value, I think in the UK is above a thousand pounds, uh, then they do ask for a credit check. OK, so they do. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, someone said, do we even need this depending on the amount? Uh, I completely agree. If it's a very tiny amount, then of course not. But we are presuming in the story they're buying a TV that is of a certain value and that Christoph potentially oh. up because he's setting up his house and he has a lot of different purchases. So he's trying to manage his cash flow. Um, so let's assume here the TV costs about $400. And let's assume that Christoph is looking for any help he can get in spreading the cost of every purchase he's making, including the TV, and therefore, you know, needs some help. Would that be fair to say? OK. So I think we've got some good responses here. Any any comments, anything that you're missing, uh, Sahil? Are you happy with the input so far? You're on mute, Sahil. Yeah, I think I think we've got some great ideas and some great questions um, to to get those uh, gears moving. Um, but I think we're at a good place. OK, excellent. So let's just move into. The next board, which is a little bit, you know, even more complex than what we just handled so far. So based on the things that we've seen pop up from our audience in terms of inputs for each of these questions. What we'd like to now do 
is take out some key insights from the demand side, which is what is the customer in this case, Christoph, looking for from the point of view of financing a medium sized ticket item. What is the merchant in this case, the embedder trying to do? Right. So what is the key insight that's coming out from all these comments? And likewise with the enabler who is providing the actual financing from the back end. Uh, what 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 is something that has really struck us as being the most critical insight in all of this? So what we'd like to now do is spend a minute just going through and what might be useful to do is just maybe a voting session on the stuff on the left hand side, Katrina, to see which one of these resonates the most that we can extract and sort of reword as an insight that we can use. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, so let's start a voting session. And I'm going to give everyone just one vote. And we will do it for just the first section. So just to focus everyone's attention, we are focusing on the first question. Yeah. Which one of these resonates the most as the most insightful thing that a consumer such as Christoph might be thinking about as he goes to a merchant to buy a TV? Only one vote is hard. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> Can we open it up to at least two? I can't for this one. Okay, we'll do it again after this one then. Yeah. Or we can do it for the next one. We'll keep okay. this as a hard one and we'll for the second <laughs> one we'll give everyone two. We have a few more people that we're waiting for to vote, um, so we'll give them a couple more seconds and then I will close the voting session. All right, I'm going to close the voting session in three, two, one. OK, so you should be able to see on your screen um, what we had the top votes for. So we have the top one as dispute management. So you need do you want to um, Maybe move that to our other board and then go on to vote, or would you want to just do all the voting right now? I see a lot of um, tools on a few of them. So I was wondering if those was worth doing another round on this one. Yeah, sure. Very good point. Trade off between convenience and problem resolution. Yeah. Trust, track of payments, which is convenient. Trust is separate. The other one is affordability and then simplicity of the process. So there or are maybe several... we just. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think we are going in the same direction, Katrina. I think we just take out the attributes that we're seeing people talk about and just plonk it on the insights board there. But the, yeah, the I would say that maybe we, we call them convenience and dispute management. Yeah. 
Those are the top two. Yep. Quality, simplicity. Okay. This is what people Great. are looking for in, in general. Okay, yes. let's go to the next one. All right. I'll give everyone two votes this time. <laughs> All right, I see that we have seven people voting still, so I give everyone one more minute and then we're going to close the session. Final call on voting. All right, I'm going to close it in three, two, one. All right, we see here that we have the top votes for rewards and single point of contact. Those seem like two very good summary points that we talked about when we were doing this, right? The reward side of it and that single point of contact. Oh, perfect. Thanks, Amy. Anything else to add to the insights for this one before we move for, to the next voting session? I think sorry, that summarizes it quite well. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not looking at the camera, so I didn't know <laughs> you were on mute. Uh, no, I, was, I was saying it's worth uh, talking about the rent own program that's got three votes as well, which is a brilliant mm -hmm. idea, actually. Why not? Perfect, yeah, let's bring it over. We're ready for three. Perfect. And keep us honest, I'm going to set the timer for two minutes and then that's when I'm going to stop the voting session. <laughs>
I see 11 people still voting and we have less than a minute. So just a reminder to please get those votes in. Great, seeing that there's only six people that still need to vote. We have 20 seconds left. And I'm going to close the voting session now. OK. We have open banking data sharing data from other institutions. Um, behavioral prediction with demographic data with social indexing may help. Long term customer behavior with the merchant. Do we even need this depending on the amount? <laughs> and bank account history in previous country. I like the history in different country. I wonder how you can make that work, especially with PSD2 and so on. But I guess open banking can help. Yeah. Right, maybe it's that open banking data sharing idea. Those two are connected. Okay. I think anything with a five and a three is important to carry over. Yes. Okay. Brilliant. We are a very efficient lot of people. We're going through this like champs. <laughs> we got insights one, two, and three all sorted. And now we need to ask the questions against each of these segments, which is on the right hand side. The question that we frame, this is the Fenastra definition of the problem, but it's up for discussion now. So tell us how you feel about it. The first question from the consumer uh, lens is how might we? access easy and cheap financing at point of sale. Did that capture some of the key insights that we generated so far? Convenience, affordability, dispute, simplicity. And we're saying access easy and cheap financing at point of sale. Anything else we want to add to this question? Maybe we want to say Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I, I, I was just <laughs> going to say that trust. It seems that trust dispute management has a lot to do with trust. So maybe there's a component yep. of trust. You were on the same wavelength because I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> Easy. What's the word? Trust. Worthy. That doesn't sound right, but you know we we are. We know what we're talking about, I suppose. Access easy, trustworthy, cheap financing. Cheap sounds weird. Let's call it affordable. Mm -hmm. We also had a comment um, from David that said time also. So quick, um, like timely. Maybe we want to add that in as well. Yeah, good point. Great. That sounds well rounded enough. Yep. Any, no. Anyone has any comments or critique to this particular how might we statement? I 
Okay, if not, let's move on to the next one. So from the merchant's point of view, the question was how might we provide more omni-channel financing options to loyal customers, enabling more purchases? So this rent to own program makes me think of alternative forms of ownership almost. So provide more omnichannel innovative financing and ownership. It's almost like a uh, subscription service. Mm. I was wondering if there was a way for us to include in this one statement without making it too convoluted, the rewards point. Each of them is dis distinct. A single point of contact is an end-to-end -end sort of one-stop shop type of thing. Yeah, and Jennifer um, in the chat had a good point that maybe it's less about loyal customers and more about embedding re rewards into financing. Yeah, but if you don't have value of data points on the level of loyalty someone shows, how do you configure your rewards program? I mean, loyalty is inherent in deciding how much money or value you would assign to a specific customer. Maybe that embedding rewards into financing, we should add that into there as well. Uh, provide more omnichannel, innovative, rewards based financing. I, I just want to play devil's advocate here for a second. And when we are rewarding the behavior of taking on more debt, that may not be the best way of looking at it. It should, I, I would say it should be more about rewarding loyalty rather than rewarding taking more debt. Yeah, but that's not what I think they're talking about. The rewards is, as uh, you know, is one additional service offering within the merchant offering is what I understood that point as. Please, whoever made that point, please, you know, feel free to shed some more light on that. Yeah, we were saying, I thought we were saying that the merchants would challenge this idea through rewards. So you'd have to somehow tie the two together. That's what drove my comment, right? We're saying the rewards would be a challenge to usage. So if you want usage of this product, and I'm assuming there's going to be some uplift for the merchants, right? then you'd have to t also tie it to rewards somehow so that you get both those, you know, you cover how they would challenge it. Yeah, I mean, I agree in that if there is a loyalty program and if loyalty is of value to the merchant, which normally it is, then just by virtue of that, there has to be some reward mechanism, right? You're positively reinforcing a specific behavior, which is buying repeatedly at that particular merchant as opposed to the competitors. So there has to be a rewards mechanism for that behavior rather than the lending aspect of it. It's not, you're not rewarding the borrowing aspect of it. You're, you're rewarding the purchase aspect of it. Perfect. Yeah. Right. Agreed. Can we reward the payment of the loan? in terms of incentivizing a healthy uh, behavior for the customer, healthy financial behavior? That's a really interesting point. I, I think that's, hopefully that would be helpful <laughs> to a lot of people, right? <laughs> to incentivize that, that repayment. 
Yeah. Is that fair? Perfect. OK, let's do the last one then. So this one had lots of different points. This, this is going to be a challenging one. So we said bank history in previous country, open banking, long term customer behavior. So it's a combination of. Past credit history in other markets and transaction history with the merchant. So one is external data based on generic sort of credit history and the other is more internal merchant data but in another market correct and then we have do we need this yeah well we don't necessarily need to apply that specific algorithm let's say we're building one to smaller ticket items um and then behavioral prediction with demographics social indexing yes uh there's something called propensity to spend modeling so we can apply specific you know logic based on all these indicators based on credit history it's as well as uh, shopping history all right so the question here is how might we address credit worthiness of new to credit as well as regular customers at the merchant point of sale that's generic enough how do you feel about that I think that makes sense from from my point of view, right? Because maybe this data sharing point is more of, um, you know, our solutioning side of it. Like maybe that's how how you address that credit credit worthiness. Does anyone else have any thoughts? I, I just want to. Uh, sorry, go ahead, JJ. Go ahead. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to 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 capture the, the idea of uh, why why do we need the the the, the assessment in the first place? Uh, I, I believe identifying opportunities where you do not need the credit worthiness check uh, is is as, as important, perhaps. We decided that because someone is trying to borrow against a television and that costs around $400 that we might want to do that. I mean, that's just the story we built, right? Um, yes, if it's $20, you don't want to do that. But I think the crux of what we're trying to get to is assuming someone is new to credit, how might we assess credit worthiness when you don't have credit history in that market, in the new market? So that's what we're trying to capture in that how might we question. Is that fair? Yeah, sure. And that, that point there about should we even do that, that's absolutely relevant, but it's not necessarily the key question that we're trying to address. Yes, Sahil, please go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to bring up one quick point was, um, do we want to mention that we're not only looking at financial data, but even non-financial data? Do we want to mention that or keep it open? To what end? To assess credit worthiness or for something else? Uh, to uh, yeah, to address credit worthiness. So, is it only your financial past that defines that, or are there other touch points or other data points that actually show uh, that you are a good customer, uh, which might not be uh, being used today? But is there an opportunity to use more data points uh, to say you're part of a uh, I don't know, you're part of a club or you're part of a group or you're another loyalty program that shows that, yes, you are uh, worthy enough to be provided this service. Yep. Uh, I know some alternative credit uh, fintech companies have very creative means of assessing credit worthiness, such as looking at how regularly you're paying your rent if you're renting or how uh, regularly you're paying for your Netflix account. So very small indicators, but it's the aggregate of all these indicators that add up and make a story come together for someone who has a lot of gaps in their data sort of profile, right? So in the how might we question here for insight three, 
Are you suggesting, Sahil, that it's important to address non-financial and financial elements within the question? Yeah. Yeah, since we're talking about credit worthiness and new to credit, since we're using those financial terms, I don't want uh, the focus to only be in the financial data points. It can be non-financial data points as well. Okay. Yeah, great point. Is that fair? Yep. Anything else we want to add? Considering that we are working with new to credit population, uh, maybe uh, building that credit worthiness is, is as important. So education and, you know, this kind of, because many, many of, of uh, the customers are not, not in this specific case, because there's it's someone that moving, that's moving countries, but the new to credit population, maybe they're just starting uh, their lending and their, you know, financial uh, uh, commitments uh, and, and they need education and support. Would that be something that is taken on by the enabler or the embedder? It would be the merchant that has a vested interest in building and educating, you know, someone who's new to credit so that they are loyal to them. And, you know, the same logic that Amex would use for someone who's, you know, a teenager who's got their first Amex card and catch them young and watch them grow logic, right? So would that be something that we'd like to add to the previous one inside to how might we question here? Yeah, it, it may be, yes. Um, it, it, from the point of view of the customer, it would be the embedder anyway, because we're trying to do a single point of contact, yeah. but that, that the actual capability might be built by the enabler. Mm -hmm. What's the word? How do we want financial discipline? To build on credit profile. Uh, awareness and discipline is being aware of your credit score, your credit worthiness, and what are the factors that go into it. Fair? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it wasn't here. Okay. If everyone's happy with that, we know what our tasks are from the lens of each of these three players in the story. So we have covered the customer lens, we've covered the embedder, the merchant lens, as well as the enabler, in this case, the financial institution that's providing the back-end financial might to the offering overall. All right, so let's move on to the next section and the last and final section of the day. What we'd like to now start doing is thinking about in light of everything that we've asked, which is how might we on the left hand side. From a lens of the customer, the merchant, as well as the enabler, we now we now want to start talking about key pain points that they see. And what might we do to remove that pain point? Thanks, Katrina. All right, so this is an ideation session again. So we'll go one by one, two minutes each, should we? Right, and so, um, you know, just before we start that timer, we're going to be ideating on what those pain points are that the customer has for thinking about this question, right? To access easy, timely, 
uh, trustworthy and affordable financing at point of sale? What are their pains right now? Um, and I'm going to set a timer for, I'm going to do, let's see, we'll do two minutes for each one, rapid brainstorming, and then we'll get to everything, hopefully. Um, whoever has written good customer support, is that a pain point? Not not entirely clear. So if you could please either reword that or expand on that. Some of these look like maybe they're turning into gains, Sahini. Um, yeah, I mean, the focus here is to think about the pain points that the customer is facing. Uh, right. Complex processes, not being eligible, that's a pain point. Um, the being unclear what the loan terms are. Um, availability of early payment options, I would say that's a gain. So I'm going to move that to our column to the right. Um, High interest rates on credit cards. Yep, that's a pain point. Um, financial capacity available to make the purchase. Clear understanding terms. I think if they're clearly understanding the terms, that's a gain. So I'm going to move that over. An awareness of the financial options available. Again, a gain. Mm. I think, Katrina, would it be worth explaining the difference between the pain and the gain and how to think about them distinctly? Yeah, I, I'm also even thinking, Sini, maybe the pain point is, is a bit repetitive to what we had done earlier. Um, so maybe we do want to just move to this gains column, since I think that's where we're, we are kind of focusing. Yeah. yeah. So why don't we just switch gears a little bit? and move just to this gain column here. So I'm um, summoning everyone here and I'll show you that we're going to be focusing in this column, these gains. So let's do the same um, exercise that we just did, but thinking about the gains, right? So how might we access easily, easy, timely, trustworthy, and affordable financing at point of sale? What would those gains be for them? Um, so I'm going to set a timer for two minutes. Um, and we already have a couple ideas down. Yeah, this is where you say, all right, here are things that I've experienced in the past that are really painful to me, but if you did this, it would be a gain in terms of my customer experience. So think about it from a lens of what might uh, remove the pain. What experience can they deliver or that you would expect is delivered that removes the pain? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Comment or whoever said TV exclamation mark. <laughs> yeah. Free, in fact, that would be the best game. Okay. 
I'm also going to move over transparency to the gains. I think that's a big gain. All right, that's time. I think we I think this gear switch scene worked well because um, we're seeing some great points and comments that were put down. Um, as we re review these, does anyone have any questions before we move to the to the next section, looking at the merchant gains? All right, now let's move and think about again, putting on our merchant hat, what would be the gain to the merchant here? What can they provide here? So I'm going to set the timer for two minutes. And please, when you answer that, please make sure that we've answered each of the how might we questions. There's three there. Omni-channel, innovative, loyalty-based financing and ownership options, enabling more purchases, incentivize healthy financing behavior, and enabling educating customers on financial awareness and discipline. So there's three elements there. So how might we create gains for each of these in the offering? We'll give everyone a couple seconds to wrap up their thoughts. We're seeing loyalty, education, trust, more, more sales, selling more. creating a stronger relationship. Brand differentiation. That's interesting. I don't think we've talked about that brand differentiation as being a big gain for this. These look great. 
Any additional comments or thoughts that folks have after looking at this or questions? I guess none of these points speak to incentivizing healthy financial be behavior, really. I would say education does. How is education an incentive? I would say, though, that when you're becoming more educated and you're learning more, that would incentivize me to want to do something like this, right? Like I'm learning about a new process and I'm gaining more education and I know what I need to do. So that makes me want to lend or want to take on lending. Um, but maybe that's a bit of a stretch. <laughs> yeah, I think when we say incentive, we are talking about a direct impact on the either the points system within the loyalty program or an impact on the discounts on offer to that particular person because we are trying to reward good behavior, right? But yeah, someone's writing a very nice, so we're gamifying, you know, behavior and potentially, yeah. Mm -hmm. So something, something interesting is after, after repayment, uh, if you provide rewards after repayment, that's a very good point to re-engage because that's there, there has been some time between the first the, the, the sale and, and that point, and that could be a you know milestone, celebrate and re-engage the first customer for the next sale. Yeah. So I had a hard one with the hard time with this one because of the healthy financial behavior and the like, are the merchants really that altruistic and they're wanting to provide this to educate? And I mean, it's 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 a good way to look at it, but I don't know if that's why, if that's the gain the merchant's really getting, unless they just really want to make the world a better place. So I had a hard time with that piece of it, honestly. It made me question having it in there, like just putting that out there. Because I don't know that merchants are driven there might be one or two, but I think merchants want to make money, <laughs> right? So when I was trying to think about what to, to type there, I, that thought really challenged that for me. If we're really trying to reflect the merchant's pains and gains, like it's not painful for the merchant unless they don't get repaid, I guess. It's just risky. It's risky for them to take it on versus someone else taking on the lending responsibility. Uh, Jennifer, I'd like to respond to that. I'm sure Sahil, you have a point of view on that. But if we play this out, let's say I become irresponsible with my credit line that I have with this particular merchant and I'm no longer able to make the purchases that I normally make with them, who stands to lose in this? Both me, the customer, as well as the merchant, because they're losing potential sales, future sales from me, because I've been irresponsible with that credit line and I can no longer be as frequent in the purchases I'm making with them. So that's one outcome that they may want to care about and prevent so that I keep spending with them rather than paying interest to the, the financial aspect of that credit line, right? That's just me, but keen to hear what Sahil has to say or JJ, what you have to say to that. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree uh, with Sahini. Um, there's, it's a double-edged sword. Um, we want people to use more credit because it's uh, another revenue stream. But when you think about it from a long term, you want customers who are using credit who also have a great financial um, um, habit and they're healthy in terms of uh, their spending um, because you don't want only revolvers. You want customers who are both uh, using your credit, uh, paying back on time, um, and, and then more. also yeah, uh, and, and buying more and using that more. Um, and, and you want a healthy mix. Uh, that's how your um, overall business risk will be managed. You need to have both sets and education is going to be extremely important because you want overall your customers to be going in a positive trajectory 
Um, See, I agree that you didn't send them to be have healthy financial behavior, but I don't know that these merchants would take on the activity of actual education unless it gave them an edge or some, you know, better, you know, like I shop here because I learn a little financial tidbit every day. <laughs> you know, like I just don't I don't see that being their role or that that they so, would really do that. So I think you could I would focus more on the incentive side of the house versus full on financial. That's so you, what tripped me up was the educate part. So Jennifer, when you think about it, the role that the merchant is playing over here is the one who's going to be dispersing the loan and it becomes right. a decision on risk versus reward. Um, to be able to take that risk, they need to make sure that the person that they're lending to is a good, healthy customer. And they have the incentive to educate this customer to continue keeping them on a healthy trajectory. You wouldn't want... Uh, doctors have an incentive for, to get me to eat healthier, but, you know, like in the end, their job is to to diagnose my pain. I, you know, like I just, I think, I think we want it to be that because it would be a beautiful world, but I'm just, I'm a product person. I, I, I don't think if we talk to merchants, that would be something that came up. Like, I, 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 I like naturally. To I like to commend that. <clears throat> I agree with that. Uh, I, I I believe that it's all incentives. So the question is that if the embedder can be can take part of the risk, they are partially underwriting the loan. They're aligning incentives. Now the question is that the merchant underwriting part of the loan is something that improves the overall offering. If that's true, if for example that improves. Uh, loan rates, pricing for the customer or access to the customer uh, that, that that will make all the, all the ecosystem be aligned to improve the customer uh, lending behavior. Because now if, if the customer is not paying you as a merchant, you have will have to take on that on that loss. So if, if the merchant is not underwriting even partially the, 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 the loan, um, I believe aligning incentive is going to be very different. Very difficult. But I think it's a really good point, Jennifer, because um, that's the way the world used to work before, right? Where there was really no incentive, especially, I mean, for categories such as payday loans, which are highly short term and extremely predatory. You know, that's the world that we've all seen go in a completely different direction to altruism. Um, but today we're talking about banking as a service and intermediaries across any vertical can now act as a bank, right? So financial education becomes an incentive for everyone to provide, to differentiate themselves in the market. That's just my two cents to this. So if, you know, Best Buy was starting to do that as opposed to another company, I would probably veer more towards Best Buy because they're doing something that's different to what most other merchants are doing. And that, you know, that speaks to that brand differentiation point because they're behaving differently and it appeals to me as a customer. Apart from giving me, you know, an extra line of credit to make purchases, et cetera, it's also showing me how to do it responsibly. As a customer, I would find that appealing, um, but it may be a generational thing because, you know, I guess different uh, generations react to stimuli differently. There is some level of cynicism at some layers and some not so much. So I guess it's a function of so that. Maybe, as well. and maybe and I would move move that to that being the, the provider of the financing, like whatever solution you're going to provide, that could be your edge that we're going to educate your customers along the way so that they pay better. I just, I'm trying to sit in the merchant perspective yeah. and I I love it. I love that we think that people out there in business want to do this. And I'm sure there are some, uh, I'm just telling you, and I think it's an idea session. So you, you talk yeah. about it that I, I don't, I don't believe it. I don't believe it with the merchants that I merch I 
we would I would think you could do that to make the product of buy now pay letter later like better than another version of buy now pay letter later. I, I think I'd move it into that category. And and I love the idea. I don't think I'm a big, you know, capitalist pig, but <laughs> you know, I just don't I don't think that's the perspective of merchants. No, and I, I think we all hear you, Jennifer, and I think it's a great point. Um, but I do, you know, just again, I know we need to move to the next section and that we're getting close on time. But one point I think that you made, Sahini, and that's kind of critical in this discussion too, is this um, like generational gap and these new players that come that are coming into the market. So maybe putting aside the best buys, yeah. but some of those like new uh, big companies that are coming, like maybe, you know, an outdoor voices, like a, a maybe a Lululemon, something that's a little yeah. more youthful like that. I, I think that's where you get that little bit of differentiator because, you know, Lululemon isn't just your, for that ex example, it's not just your, um, you know, jacket that you put on every day. They also have your classes and you're going and you're having a community, you know, yoga session and you're meeting those folks. So I think it adds, uh, it, it becomes not just a brand and not just a company, it becomes more than that. And those are some of these new brands and companies that they're, that's really their mission now, which is really beautiful. And, and has we turn to that for that type of uh, company? is what I would say. But again, I know that we are at time. Um, Sini, any other last comments before we move to the end I here? I love this conversation. This debate has been really, really enriching and uh, fantastic point. Thank you, Jennifer, because um, this is exactly what people should be, you know, debating about because, you know, there's so many different perspectives to how something should be done and all of this matters. So great discussion. Thank you. All right, let's move on to the last one because I know we don't have a lot of time left. Yeah, maybe let's just do this as a one minute rapid brainstorm so we can get to some quick ideation here. Um, so again, thinking about our how might we question um, what are those gains for the financial institution? I'm going to set the timer for one minute and then we'll do some fast ideation after that. Great, we'll give everyone a couple seconds to wrap up their thoughts here. Of course, being able to sell more financial products, new revenue streams, data sharing could be another additional revenue stream, yep. Sharing the risk with the embedder. Alternative data for own credit products, gain payment revenue base revenue currently captured by competitors. Deepen their relationships and portfolios. Yep. And um, now thinking about all those gains that we just talked about, the financial gains, the merchant gains, and the consumer gains, what would that product or service look like? Uh, this is our, our big ideation part of this, right? And I know that we're at time now, but what, what would that look like and, and what would hit all of those, those gain points? Um, so I'm gonna set the timer for two minutes. I know people might need to drop off, but Hopefully we can get some ideas down.
right? That's time and I know we're over and that we probably have lost some folks to other meetings and the crazy busy life that we're all leading. But um, we'll let everyone finish up a couple last thoughts for what those solutions could look like. Um, but as we do that, I just wanna thank everyone for the amazing engagement. I think this was an amazing, amazing discussion. Um, and even though we didn't get to, you know, spend too much time ideating, I think those gain points is what was really critical, right? So as these hackers and hackers, you know, watching the recording and right now hackers, um, taking those gain points and figuring out what your solution needs to have, right? To be a great solution and something that's uh, super impactful. Um, so with that, I'll pass it over Sini to you for any closing remarks. I just want to add to say I had a lot of fun. Thank you, Saha, for this fantastic brief. I think um, it's a really interesting point. It's highly topical uh, and on trend. Um, I'm curious to hear how you found it and if you found value in uh, having this session. Absolutely. Tremendous value. I think the uh, debate, the questions, the brainstorming, uh, great feedback from people, great participation. Um, and thank you, uh, Katrina and uh, Saini, for moderating the session. Uh, thanks uh, to Finastra for setting up Pack to the Future. Uh, it's a great platform. Uh, I think tremendous ideas are going to be coming out from this platform. So it's uh, it's uh, fantastic to be participating in this. And uh, thank you for the opportunity. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you all. It was really fun. And hope you have a great rest of the day. Yes, thank you. Thank you. See you. Bye. 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 Bye.